Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this afternoon's program, which is presented to, to you by the Orthodox Union. I'm Judy Steinig. I'm representative of the Young Israel of Bayside in Queens, New York, and I'm a brand new member of the staff of the Orthodox Union. I'm the Associate Director of Community Services. It is a pleasure and an honor to be here today and be part of this wonderful program. Uh, which we will be introducing shortly. Uh, as part of any program, we always like to make everything what we call a work in progress. And we certainly want to listen to all of the feedback that we hope you're giving us. Now, one piece of, one little piece came to us just a few minutes ago, and I would like to reinforce and make sure that everybody knows she'd be comfortable with giving us suggestions. And someone had asked that we go around, and, we, and perhaps in the future we'll have name tags, but we didn't have a chance to do that today. So we'd like to go around the room and just find out from everybody where, where everybody is from. So that this way, this, this should not just be a purely educational experience, we want this to also be a social experience. And hopefully, many of you will be uh, reuniting with friends you might not have seen in many years, or hopefully making new friends. So if everybody can bear with me for a minute or two, uh, as I said, I'm Judy Steinig, I'm from Queens, and if we can start and go row by row and just let us know who you are and what community you're from. Sir? Sam. Wait, so speak up loudly. Sam. Okay. Marvin Collins of Milford. Michael Gainter from Forest Hills. I'm a neighbor. Oh, very nice to meet you. <laughs> okay. Where are you from? What was your name? I'm sorry. Edna Pizer. Edna Pizer from Teaneck. Daniela Koich of Brad. Okay, well, that that's a little long distance. Very nice to have you, you. sir. So, from where? Fort Lee. Fort Lee. Teaneck. Okay. You're gonna, I thought you were going to bring us warm weather. <laughs> Englewood. River Edge. Wow, it's nice to know that people are coming in from so many areas. It shows the importance of such a program. What is your name? <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Rosenberg. Yeah. Your speaker. Okay. <laughs> we'll be hearing from Devar in a few minutes. The next row? Okay, double affiliation, yes. <laughs> okay, so you're from the same places, yeah. Okay. Okay. All right, nice. See, we already made one one bond. Did we get here from everybody? And I want to give particular thank you to my associates Hannah Farkas and Adina Schwartzbaum, who made. I just came aboard to this program, and it was all set up. And having done event programming for 16 years, I can tell you that there is a huge amount of work that goes into it. And Hannah and Adina made it all happen. So we want to thank them so much. Was there anybody that I didn't get to? Has everybody introduced themselves? I'm sorry. Also our speaker. Okay, everybody, everybody's been introduced? Okay, we hope that you have a wonderful afternoon. At this point, I'd like to call on our speaker, Devorah Schwechter, Schwechter, who will be speaking about nutrition. Thank you so much. Hannah's going to be passing out handouts. They're going to kind of support. They're going to kind of support what we're talking about here. So, as she said, my name is Deborah Wechter. I am a Teaneck resident. Oh, that's an unusual comment. Most people can hear me fine. Um, 
and I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about nutrition, just a little bit of background in general about nutrition. It's a relatively young science. If you think about how long we've been practicing medicine, whether we've been doing it right or wrong, we've been practicing medicine for a long time. Nutrition is actually relatively young. The first vitamin was not isolated until the late 1800s. So the last century, the 1900s, was really focused on finding the vitamins and minerals, identifying them, figuring out what they do in your body, why they're important, determining how much we need to have in order to be adequate, not to be deficient. And that's kind of been most of the focus in the 1900s. The late 1900s and now, in this century, the focus has shifted a little bit away from deficiency, and it's more focused on optimizing your nutrition. And what do I mean by optimizing your nutrition? It means that now the focus is going to be a little bit more on how can we eat different foods, how can the different vitamins and minerals potentially prevent me from developing or mitigate the effects of chronic disease. Can something I eat potentially prevent me from getting cancer, prevent me from getting heart disease, or if I already have those diseases, hopefully offset some of the symptoms that we have with those diseases. So that's kind of the focus. It's relatively new, and that's kind of what makes nutrition so exciting right now and at the same time so frustrating because we don't really know a lot yet. We're still trying to figure it out. You're going to hear one thing 10 years later. You're going to hear the complete opposite. And it's not because they're lying. It's just because they're still trying to figure it out. So I'm going to focus on just a few of the nutrients that I thought might be relevant. Um, clearly, we could talk all day about every nutrient, but we don't have time. So first, I'm going to talk to you about calcium. Calcium is important in many areas of our life. 99% of the calcium in your body is stored in your bones and in your teeth. Okay, and it's part of an integral structure of your bones. Basically what happens is calcium is part of the mineral that is, contributes to the density of your bones. Your bones are actually constantly in flux. They're constantly building up and breaking down every single day. 1% uh, of your calcium is found in your blood. Okay, that calcium is important for nerve transmission, muscle contraction, including the contraction of your heart. It helps maintain blood pressure. Here's an important thing to know. The 1% blood calcium that we have is so important that your body will take the calcium from its bones in order to maintain a stable blood calcium level. So in essence, your bones act as a reservoir for your blood calcium. You don't eat enough calcium to maintain the level steady in your blood, then you're gonna take it from your bones. And that is why eating enough calcium is so associated with strong bones. Basically, about after 10 years after adult, adult height is achieved, you stop adding density to your bones. So that's why we push so much with the younger generation who, of course, don't care about anything, that we want to have calcium in your diet. You know, when they're young, when they're growing, even when they're in their early 20s, we want to push as much as possible to meet your calcium needs because that's really when you're laying down the foundation that's going to keep, keep you going forward as you get older. Once you hit the age of approximately 30 and 40, not only are you not adding calcium to your bones, but you're losing calcium. So your density is slowly decreasing. So getting enough calcium in your diet does not necessarily stop you from losing calcium, but it might slow it down a little bit. In fact, not only eating calcium, but also having physical activity can also help protect your bones. Um, so how much calcium do we need? So on your handout, I have uh, the first page and the top, we talk about the calcium requirements. So first, before I get into that specifically, I wanted to mention how we determine how much we need of any, any vitamin or mineral. There's something called the Dietary Reference Intakes, or the DRIs. It's put out by the Food and Nutrition Board of the Institute of Medicine of the National Academies. If anyone is comfortable on the internet, you could look up the DRI tables, and you could have it not only for calcium, but for all the vitamins and minerals out there. There's three values that are important on the dietary reference intakes. The first one is the RDA, the, re uh, the recommended dietary allowance, not daily allowance, dietary allowance, that actually refers to the average level you need to take of any nutrient in order to meet your needs of most healthy individuals. I believe it's 97 to 98% of most healthy individuals. That's what the RDA represents. But how often? Daily. But it's not called cool daily. That's the, one of the first things we learn about in my nutrition classes. It's dietary, not daily. I don't know why it makes a difference. 
Um, the next one is the adequate intake, or the AI. This is the value that's established when there isn't really enough evidence to get a firm RDA. So they have data, they have research, they believe it's probably enough, it's an estimation of what they think is enough for you to have every day, but it's not necessarily as firm as the RDA. So naturally, if you have an RDA, you wouldn't have an AI, but there are vitamins, there are nutrients, rather, that don't have an RDA, so we'll be using an AI. And finally, the last one is the UL, the tolerable upper intake level. So that basically is the amount that we believe it's safe for you to have on a given day without having adverse health effects. Okay, so those are the reference numbers, the reference values you're gonna be seeing if you were to look up anything on the DRI table. So specifically to calcium, I kind of shortened the table to just include what I believe represents the age group in attendance, so 31 to 71 and over. Um, the DRI tables actually start at birth. So for 31 to 50, it doesn't differentiate between men and women. You should be having 1,000 milligrams of calcium a day. 51 to 70-year-old men, 1,000. 51 to 70-year-old women, 1,200. Why the difference between women and men? Menopause. When you have menopause and you have decreased estrogen, you have accelerated bone loss. So to offset the accelerated bone loss that you might have with menopause, they increase the requirement. Um, and then greater than 71 is also 1,200, and this is because as you get older, your digestive tract doesn't absorb calcium as efficiently as it does when you're younger. So these are the uh, recommended dietary allowances for calcium. So what are our food sources of calcium? I gave you a little table at the bottom of the page of examples of food sources. This is, of course, not an exhaustive list, and I do want to also clarify that brand to brand, you might find differences in the amount of calcium in any given category. So don't assume, oh, it says 299 milligrams of calcium in milk. Well, that's it. There might be one brand that has slightly more or less calcium, depending on how they produce it. Um, milk products, dairy products, tend to be the best absorbed source of calcium. So usually we do try to push it because it is kind of the best source. The plant forms of calcium tend to sometimes not be absorbed as well because, for example, they have other compounds within the plant itself that kind of minimizes absorption of calcium. So, for example, spinach has something called phytic acid, and you might also have oxalic acid. These things limit how much you can absorb calcium. So really, your best bet is your dairy, also your fortified products. So for example, if you can't take dairy, if you're allergic or you can't tolerate it, you can buy a fortified soy milk product and it can be equivalent to uh, the milk product. Similarly, they now fortify orange juice with calcium. I feel like they fortify orange juice with just about everything. Um, so you can certainly look to that if you don't like any kind of milk or milk type substance. So how do we measure if we have enough? Well, of course, one of the best ways to do it is look at your diet. In order to be healthy, I think it is important to be deliberate about our food choices, and that is true as well for calcium. Okay, you, if you want to know if you're getting enough calcium in your diet, the best way to do it is to start analyzing what you're eating. Obviously, we don't eat the exact same food every day, but we tend to follow patterns. Usually weekdays follow a similar pattern. Maybe Shabbos is different, maybe Sunday. Maybe you're coming out to an OU lecture and your food is a little different for lunch. But for the most part, you follow a particular pattern. So start looking at the labels of the foods that you're eating. Unfortunately, the labels don't list it as milligrams. They list it as percent daily value. Okay, so percent daily value, the calcium is like the easiest one. It's 1,000 milligrams. So if it has 40% for calcium, you have 400 milligrams. 50%, 500 milligrams. Okay, so if you see every label is required to tell you how much calcium is in there, even if it's zero. So you can determine by the food if you're getting enough. So you would add it up and determine if on most days I'm getting 1,000. If one day a week on Shabbos, let's say, you don't have enough calcium, excuse me, that's fine. But in general, it should be on average every day close to what your recommended dietary allowance is. Um, another way you might think, okay, well, I go to the doctor, I get my blood work checked, I'll get my blood calcium level, it'll tell me if I'm eating enough. Eh, sorry, it doesn't work like that. Remember what we said in the beginning of the lecture. Your blood calcium level is kept stable at the expense of your bones. If you are not eating enough calcium in your diet, theoretically your blood calcium level will remain stable, but your bones will start losing a lot more calcium. 
There are instances where your blood calcium level will be low, but it's usually not correlated with not eating enough calcium. It's usually affiliated with some other medical problem or maybe some other treatment that you're taking. So you should not assume that if your blood calcium level is good on your blood work, that that means you're getting enough. Okay, so the best bet really is, again, to analyze your diet and determine if you're getting enough calcium. You could also, maybe we'll save questions um, for the end, that way we'll group them to, maybe at the end of each uh, nutrient we'll have a little quick session for questions. Um, some people take a bone density test, that's something you should definitely discuss with your doctor to determine if you're nervous, I haven't had enough calcium, maybe it's in my family, genetics, someone, my great aunt broke her hip when she was 80, I want to make sure I don't have osteoporosis. Certainly it's worthwhile to discuss with your doctor if you wanted to have a bone density test. So what if you look at your diet and you're not getting enough calcium, what do you do? Well, then you consider taking a supplement. I want to have a disclaimer right off the bat. Never take any supplements without discussing it with your doctor. People tend to think supplements, eh, they're not really medication. They're, not, they're over the counter. I can buy it anywhere I want, the health food store, wherever. You should be discussing it with your doctor because they can interact with other medications that you're taking. And perhaps you have some medical condition that makes a supplement inappropriate in your specific situation. So there's two of the more common calcium supplements out there, calcium carbonate, that's going to be in your, like, your Tums, and calcium citrate, like the most common one I can think of is like the Citracal. Okay, calcium carbonate tends to be a little bit cheaper. The only problem with calcium carbonate is that it um, needs to be taken with food. So if you are taking a calcium carbonate supplement, and it will be listed on your calcium supplement, the source of calcium. If it is a calcium carbonate supplement, you must be taking it with food in order to maximize the absorption. Calcium citrate, on the other hand, does not require you to have any kind of food, you know, it doesn't, so you can take it regardless of whether or not you've eaten at that moment. Um, additionally, uh, stomach acid production tends to decrease as we get older, so even if you do take it with a meal, calcium carbonate may not be absorbed as best as it would be when we're younger. So it might be worthwhile if you're investing in a supplement to look for the one that's calcium citrate anyway, because once you're taking it, you wanna make sure you're getting the most that you can. Additionally, calcium supplements usually aren't absorbed beyond about 500 milligrams in one shot. So if you look at your diet and you say, eh, I need about 500 milligrams, I'm getting maybe half my needs or most of my needs, I wanna just hedge my bets with a 500 milligram supplement, so take it. But if you say, you know what, I eat nothing with calcium. I have to take all of my needs in a supplement form. You would, I would recommend you take it in divided doses, at least two hours apart, okay? So you wanna take 500 milligrams. I know some pills come in 600 milligrams. You don't wanna buy a calcium pill that comes as a 1,000 milligram pill because in essence what you're doing is you're losing about half of it, but doesn't get absorbed. Additionally, if you are taking any kind of iron supplement, iron and calcium fight for absorption. So I would also separate my iron pill from my calcium supplement when I'm taking it. A lot of us might be on iron. So that's kind of where we are on supplementation. What about toxicity? You have on your paper the upper tolerable intake level that's listed, that's the UL for the different ages. Most of the data that we have for calcium toxicity is really affiliated with um, supplements. It's unusual to find a toxicity with calcium from food. So the most common toxicity symptom that we see with calcium is kidney stones. Well, in fairness, sometimes it's really just a function of not drinking enough. There are people, if you have kidney stones or have had kidney stones or are currently going through the process, you should definitely speak to your doctor. He may not want you on a calcium supplement. Um, there are other issues, like for example, if you have any kind of kidney failure, if you're taking any kind of diuretic, that could also put you at risk for your supplement to be in excess earlier than, let's say, a healthy individual. So again, that's why it's so important to discuss your supplement with your doctor. So just to sum up calcium, it's important for our bones. Your blood calcium level will not necessarily be indicative of an adequate intake in your diet. The best way is to kind of review your diet and determine if you're getting enough. If you're not getting enough in your diet, talk to your doctor about taking a supplement. If you wanna take more than 500 milligrams supplementation, divide it up into two doses. Separate your supplement from your iron. If you're taking calcium carbonate, you wanna take it with meals. Any questions on calcium?
Uh, no, there's a lot of foods. Um, the question was, if you're required to be on a dairy-free diet, is the only option left to you supplements? The answer is absolutely not. There are other foods. I mean, I don't know, can you have orange juice? Can you have soy? I mean, is soy milk considered dairy? No, it's, it's, it's not cow's milk, it's plant milk. So in theory, there are ways. You can even eat sardines with bones. I don't know, my dad does that. And, and you could potentially get calcium in that format. So you're not limited to just dairy products. It's traditionally the easiest way to get your calcium, but it is not exclusively the only way. Just start looking at labels. They, I, to be honest, they throw calcium in things I can't even imagine. I feel like they have bread, oatmeal. They throw calcium in a lot of different foods. So you can look for it, not just dairy. Yes? If somebody says 40%, let's say calcium, how do you know how much of that do you have to eat? It's, it's by serving size. So in other words, if it's at eight ounces of milk is the serving size and it says 40% calcium, it means in, in eight ounces of milk you have 400 milligrams of calcium. The percent daily value refers to the serving. I'm, I don't believe that it does. I don't believe that it does. I haven't heard anything. I'd have to double check, but I don't believe that grapefruit juice has any adverse effects with calcium. And also, are doctors generally up on supplements? Do they know what they do, how they work? Or is that I hope so. Uh, some are, some are not. Now you can go with all of this information and say, hey, I heard this in a lecture. Do you know this? And how can we apply it to my particular situation? You know, unfortunately, the internet is a beautiful thing. We can look up a lot of things, but it's hard to sometimes weed out what's accurate and what's not accurate. Um, I generally like to go to government websites when I'm looking up information about vitamins or minerals. I feel like you have your best shot of it being accurate as opposed to getting the information from GNC. So you can, they have fact sheets actually on calcium, all the vitamins and minerals that you can read up on. Again, through the, um, Food and Nutrition Board that you can look up and you can bring it to your doctor. Some doctors are, some doctors are not. So about 15 years ago, there was no, most doctors did not have any knowledge of nutrition. Right. And now there's some because of continuing medical education, but still most doctors are ignorant in terms of basic nutrition. And that is why I have a job. Okay, so there is some research, I actually wrote it down here, on caffeine, okay? Some people have found that you could potentially have reduced absorption and increased excretion with um, calcium and caffeine, but the recent, um, the recent uh, research shows that you'd have to drink a lot of caffeine, I mean maybe you do, but if you're having one or two cups of coffee, that probably the amount is so minute that it's not as big a deal. I believe, let me see, it's one or two cups of coffee has really no negative effects on your bones. You only lose, in one cup of regular coffee, you only lose about two or three milligrams of calcium. So it's really not a lot. I mean if you are a coffeeholic, if that's a word, then you might, this might be a consideration, but for moderate drinking of coffee it's not an issue. Okay, so I wanted to move on now to vitamin D. Any other questions, we'll just save till the end. Okay, so vitamin D, I picked vitamin D because it kind of goes hand in hand with calcium, and it's pretty hot right now. Uh, most of you who may not have ever been checking your vitamin D levels, all of a sudden your doctor is checking your vitamin D levels. So let's talk about vitamin D. Vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin, and one of its major roles is to help maintain your calcium level. And how does it do that? It enhances absorption of calcium in your digestive tract. So basically, in order to maintain a healthy skeleton, you are going to have to have enough vitamin D as well as calcium. So one of the things that also makes vitamin D unique is that you can make it in your skin. The ultraviolet light hits your skin, it converts a precursor, to, uh, it converts a compound to a vitamin D precursor, which is subsequently activated further along in your liver and kidneys. Um, a fair-skinned person might go outside for 10 or 15 minutes and make enough vitamin D for a few days. The darker your skin is, the longer you're going to have to expose yourself to UV light in order to create enough vitamin D. Um, 
Additionally, if you wear any kind of suntan lotion above SPF 8, you probably don't make much vitamin D in your skin because it blocks the UV light. I don't recommend going outside without suntan lotion so that you can make vitamin D. There are some people who suggest maybe going outside for 10 or 15 minutes, get your vitamin D, and then put your suntan lotion on. You have to know yourself. Once you leave your house, are you really going to remember to put the suntan lotion on once you're already outside? That's something to think about, certainly to discuss with your doctor. There are other ways to get vitamin D in your diet that you don't have to rely on it exclusively from sunlight. And another thing to keep in mind is the older you get, of course, the decreased capacity to make vitamin D in your skin. In fact, people over the age of 65 have a fourfold less capa decreased capacity to make vitamin D compared to a 20 or 30 year old. So that's something to keep in mind when you're relying on sunlight. Okay, so deficiency. What happens if you don't have enough vitamin D in your diet? If you don't have enough vitamin D in your diet, you are at risk to have something called osteomalacia, which literally means the softening of your bones so what happens is your bones start to lose the calcium, okay, which we talked about, the density. And so you might have that kind of bow, bowed over spine. You might have the bowed legs. Okay, ultimately, you could also have osteoporosis, which we know is really bad because it puts you at risk for fractures, which is a very common problem as people get older. Getting enough vitamin D and calcium is necessary in order to prevent osteoporosis. So people can become vitamin D deficient for a number of reasons. Number one, they maybe they're not getting sunlight. Number two, maybe they're not eating enough vitamin D. Or number three, maybe they are eating enough vitamin D, but they have a fat malabsorption problem. Maybe for some reason they're not, they have some kind of problem that they're not able to absorb fat. If you can't absorb fat, it's difficult to absorb vitamin D. <clears throat> Excuse me. So again, if you have that kind of problem where you have trouble absorbing vitamin D, again, that would be something you'd want to discuss with your doctor. How much vitamin D do we need? That's actually the second table on the vitamin D page. There's no difference here for men and women. 31 to 50 is 600. I listed it for you as micrograms as well as international units. Most supplements and actually the percent daily value give it to you as international units. So it's probably the more common form that you're used to. Here's an example, by the way, of how nutrition is evolving. The percent daily value for vitamin D is actually 400, but here you see that it's 600, thank you. Here you see that it's 600 because the, they actually increase the RDA as more research has come out. In fact, there are some scientists who actually believe the upper tolerable intake level for vitamin D should also be increased. Right now that hasn't happened, but you might find that in the next few years they may increase what they consider to be safe. Okay, so it's 600, 600, and 800, and then you have the upper tolerable intake level there. So where do we get vitamin D in our diet? The bottom chart on the page, I have a few food sources. Vitamin D is not naturally found in a variety of foods. It's kind of in liver, fatty fish. Most of the vitamin D that we're going to get is going to be in our fortified food products like milk and grains. Okay. What's that? No, A and D in milk. Correct. Correct. And it makes sense that they would put D in milk because it's closely correlated with calcium. So Again, if you want to use the percent daily value, as I mentioned, it's 400. So if a serving says that it has 40%, that's about 160 IU. You could do the math, okay, and compare it to the label. How do we know if we're getting enough vitamin D? So of course, you can review your diet. And again, I think that's a good idea because maybe it'll help you figure out how to balance out your meals so that you optimize your nutrition. But we are also in luck. You can actually use your blood work as a marker for whether or not you're getting enough vitamin D. Phew, thank goodness. Okay, um, yes? Is that, you know, the multivitamin that most people are told to take at a certain age? Is vitamin D in that? Depends on the vitamin. I mean, there's like a hundred multivitamins out there. Some have D, some don't. They all should list that's on the back. A, that's not a typical, like, the centrum. Well, it is a vitamin, so it usually is on your multivitamin, but they have all of these specialty, subspecialty vitamins where they take particular vitamins, group them together, and try to sell them to you as, you'll never get a brain tumor if you take this. You know, so I don't know how they kind of package it, but it is one of the, usually the basics that you're going to find on a, you know, a standard multivitamin. I'm just going to finish vitamin D, and then we'll do the questions. Um, vitamin D2 is the blood level that we should be checking in your doctor's office, not vitamin D3. Vitamin D3 is the active form of vitamin D, but it's so tightly regulated and it has such a short half-life that it's really not a usable marker. 
Okay, so at the top of your vitamin D page, I actually give a table on how to understand your lab results from your doctor. Okay, so in the first column, I give you the nanomoles per liter. In the second column, the nanograms per milliliter because different labs use different methods. And of course, keep in mind that even though I've given you ranges, every lab is slightly different and the references might be slightly different. Of course, next year lab result will always be a reference range. And of course, I'm hoping that if you're getting your lab work done, you're consulting with your doctor on it. So if you're less than 30 or less than 12, it's associated with deficiency and you can have osteomalacia and subsequently osteoporosis. 30 to 50 or 12 to 20, it's not really enough to give good bone health. Greater than or equal to 50, greater than or equal to 20, it's usually good for overall health, including your bones. And then of course, over 125 or over 50, you might have potential adverse health effects. So you go to your doctor, you get your vitamin D2 level checked, and you kind of use this as your guide. If you are deficient in vitamin D, your doctor is more than likely going to recommend you take a supplement. He might give you a prescription supplement. I shouldn't say he, I should say he or she might give you a prescription supplement like a 50,000 international unit pill that you might take once a week. He might tell you to go over the counter and get a 1,000 international unit pill that you take daily. Um, and then theoretically, you should be going back to your doctor to get that value checked to see if it's been effective, the supplement has been effective, usually in about three to six months. And that's where you'll see a change. Okay, so if you are already deficient, trying to increase in your diet is usually not the way we go. We really do recommend that you go the supplement route. If your vitamin D level is perfect, congratulations. Keep doing what you're doing and just keep getting it checked. Um, there are some people who suggest you might want to take a supplement anyway. That's up to you. That's up to you and your doctor. Certainly don't exceed the upper tolerable intake level. Even if there is research out there that looks promising, right now I don't know that we know enough that it's worthwhile to exceed certainly the upper tolerable intake level. Um, there's two types of supplements that I've seen on the market, vitamin D2 and vitamin D3. As I mentioned, vitamin D3 is the active form. They both tend to be effective as a supplement, but vitamin D3 in those large doses tend to be more potent. So if you're looking for a bigger bang for your buck, so to speak, then you should probably look for the vitamin D3 supplement. Okay? And vitamin D toxicity, okay, if you have a toxicity of vitamin D, you have too much vitamin D. Um, you're going to have very nonspecific symptoms. You might be nauseated, you might have vomiting, poor appetite, constipation, weakness. Um, it could also cause you to have excessive blood calcium levels, um, which could cause mental status changes. It can cause irregular heartbeats. So if your blood level is greater than what's considered safe and you're taking a supplement, stop taking a supplement. If you're not taking a supplement that's greater, then we have to talk to your doctor about what else might be going on to be causing that problem. Okay, so to sum up, vitamin D. You can use your vitamin D2 level in your blood to determine if you are deficient or adequate in your vitamin D intake. You're going to look at your food labels. You're going to try to get your RDA through your food, fortified foods, maybe not your fatty fish if you're not a fish eater, if you don't like cod liver oil. Um, you're going to take a supplement under the care of your doctor if you find that you are deficient. You're going to try to avoid taking excessive vitamin D because you don't want to have any of these toxicity symptoms. Vitamin D is fat soluble. It gets stored in your body for the long haul. Does anyone have any questions on vitamin D? Besides the bones, is there a mood related thing to vitamin D, like sunlight, that type of thing? Does it have any effect on it? I haven't heard anything about that. If there's a mood, Related. I think the sunlight is not like an emotional thing. It's a phys physiological thing that happens. What the UV light kind of processes a compound in your skin. Um, although I guess maybe people who get more sunlight are happier. But I don't know that that really correlates with the vitamin D. Okay. Um, we're going to move on to B12. I picked B12 because it's also something that your doctor should be checking, hopefully, when you go to him. Um, there seems to be, uh, you know, research that shows that there might be a correlation between vitamin B12 and dementia, which we'll get to a little bit later. <coughs> right. So I wanted to just briefly talk about vitamin B12. B12 is important in new cell synthesis. It's part of many coenzymes in your body. It's important for red blood cell formation. It's also important for nerve function. Okay. So B12, if we get B12 from our food, B12 from our food is bound to the protein in the food. That means that in order to free 
the B12 from the protein, we need stomach acid. Stomach acid is what helps release the B12 from the food. So if, for whatever reason, you have decreased stomach acid, or maybe you're taking medication for reflux, you might find that you're really not able to access the B12 in your food because you're not really able to adequately separate it from the protein in an appreciable amount. Um, B12 that comes from supplements or from fortified foods is the free form of B12. So that doesn't require stomach acid, and therefore, you, if you have an issue with stomach acid, you should really focus more on the B12 from supplements and, and um, fortified foods. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, because as we get older, we naturally have decreased stomach acid production, it might be the way for us to be thinking regardless. And again, it doesn't have to be supplement, it could be fortified foods. Okay, what happens if you have a B12 deficiency? Well, you can have a B12 deficiency for a bunch of reasons. Not only can it be because you don't make sufficient stomach acid, but also because your stomach produces something called intrinsic factor. An intrinsic factor binds to the B12 and it allows it to get absorbed in your small intestine. If you don't make intrinsic factor or you don't make enough intrinsic factor, doesn't matter how free that B12 is, you're not going to absorb it. Okay, there's something called pernicious anemia that's actually an anemia because you make no intrinsic factor. Those people usually get B12 injections because they have to bypass their gut completely. So you might have a B12 deficiency if you don't eat enough or if you uh, don't produce enough stomach acid or, as I mentioned, you don't make enough intrinsic factor. Additionally, you might have a problem with B12 if you've had like a gastric bypass surgery and you're bypassing some of parts of your stomach. You might also have a problem if for whatever reason you've had surgery on your small intestine. There's one area of our small intestine called the ileum, and that's where you absorb your B12. So you've had any kind of surgery on that part of your small intestine that might also limit your ability to absorb B12. What happens if you have a deficiency? So you have something called megaloblastic anemia, which is just a fancy way of saying this is not iron deficiency anemia, this is B12 anemia. Okay, so you might have a low hemoglobin and hematocrit on your blood work, and it's not because you don't get enough iron, it could be because you don't get enough B12. Additionally, it could also be the, the anemia that's associated with B12 could also be associated with folic acid. So this is less common now, but it used to be that if you had a low hemoglobin hematocrit and they knew it wasn't from iron, they used to give you a lot of folic acid to supplement and you'd start to feel a little bit better, but oh, you would ultimately be masking that B12 deficiency that was happening underneath it and then you get irreversible nerve damage. So if for whatever reason your doctor turns to you and says, oh, I'm looking at your blood work, it looks like, oh, maybe you need to take folate, just confirm with your doctor if you made sure I don't have a problem with my B12. Okay, if you have a B12 uh, deficiency, you might have fatigue, weakness, loss of appetite, weight loss. They all seem to sort of sound the same, right? Uh, similar symptoms, obviously for different reasons. Additionally, you might actually have tingling in your fingers and in your hand, uh, in your fingers and in your feet with a B12 deficiency. In fact, you might actually feel some of these symptoms before it would show up on your anemia profile. So if you do have these symptoms, you want to ask your doctor to check your B12 level. Most doctors nowadays check a B12 level as part of your routine blood work anyway, certainly as you become an adult and move on to later years. Um, so how much B12 do we need? The, a, the RDA is on the top of the B12 page, 2.4 micrograms. That's actually the same starting at age 14 and beyond. There is no upper tolerable intake level for B12. Right now, there's no known associated adverse effects with taking too much B12. Um, so most likely because it's water soluble and if you take too much, you probably just urinate it right out, which could be very expensive, but nevertheless not necessarily harmful to you. So where do we find B12? B12 is found in most animal products, most animal proteins. So you can have it in eggs, chicken, fish, meat, dairy. Most of, the most of the time, people get enough B12, unless, of course, they have all those other issues going on. People who have to be concerned are, as I mentioned, someone who might have had a gastric bypass surgery, so maybe they're bypassing part of their stomach, or um, vegetarians. Okay, right? You can get B12 in fortified foods, so even if you are a vegetarian, you can get it in your grain products, but it is something to be aware of. So if you have someone who's young who's a vegetarian, you might want to consider having their B12 level checked even if they're, you know, just because they're vegetarian and you want to make sure they're getting enough. The percent daily value for B12 is six micrograms. 
Okay, the tricky thing about B12 is only the foods that are fortified with B12 are gonna list the percent daily value. If it's naturally found in the food, they don't list it. They only are required to list it in the foods where, that are fortified. Okay, but it is six micrograms. Like most of your cereals are all gonna be like 100% B12. So again, if you are concerned with getting enough B12 or you're concerned with not having enough stomach acid, then you focus on those fortified food products as your source of B12. B12 levels also tend to decrease with age just naturally. Um, so again, um, and your absorption of B12 is limited by, as we mentioned earlier, your intrinsic factor. So I might take a 100 microgram B12 supplement and I'm only absorbing about 10 micrograms. Okay, so you know, less may not, more may not necessarily be more. Um, but um, again, your doctor would kind of guide you as to the amount um, you should be focusing on, again, if your levels are low. So you wanna check your B12 level. If it's abnormal, you wanna focus, talk to your doctor about taking a supplement um, to get it into the normal range. Even if it's on the low end of normal, I would still talk to your doctor, hi, it's the low end of normal. Maybe you don't want me to take a supplement, but maybe I should check it again more frequently than once a year because maybe I'm heading in a direction I don't wanna be. There is, as I mentioned earlier, there might be an association with taking B12 and getting, um, having cognitive de decline and dementia. Um, that's why it was very common in a lot of Jerry Psych units to automatically check B12 levels on all the patients. Um, I, the, right now, there really isn't enough research out there for me to say, take this much B12 and you're probably not gonna get dementia. I wish there were. Uh, there's no tolerable upper intake levels. So if you wanna talk to your doctor about hedging your bets, maybe five years from now, 10 years from now, it'll be different. For right now, that would be something to discuss with your doctor. There's also been research in the past that if you take B12 as part of a B complex, it might be good for heart disease, okay, like the B6, the folate. Again, the research is not really definitive on that either. There's no tolerable upper intake level. If you want to take it, it might just be an ex inexpensive experiment. But again, something to dis discuss with your doctor if you're interested in. As I mentioned, there's no known toxicity symptoms associated with excessive, well, I guess it wouldn't be excessive, with extra B12 intake. Any questions on B12? I, I've seen these pills and maybe even start with 500 milligrams and stuff that much more than what you're Check if it's milligrams or micrograms. It might be micrograms. Um, that's kind of like that funny shaped U. Um, if they're giving you that many grams, again, there's no tolerable upper intake level. The question becomes the cost. A lot of the uh, supplements are over the counter, so you're paying for it. So ask your doctor, is this really necessary for me to take such a high dose? I'm not sure that it is but that would be something to discuss. There's some people would take, I've seen 300 micrograms, I've seen 1,000 micrograms, 500 micrograms. So that would be something to discuss with your doctor. It also depends on how low you are. Maybe once you reach and, and you achieve an adequate level in your blood, maybe you can ask your doctor about taking a slightly lower dose. And again, I think the biggest concern would be just the cost of the supplement itself. I just want to suggest you call it not intolerable, also no tolerable one. It's the upper tolerable intake level. It's not intolerable. It's upper tolerable intake level. It's how much they think you shouldn't exceed for adverse health effects. Yes? No, it's separate. It is a B vitamin, but it's not B12. It is separate. Unfortunately, we're not going to discuss folic acid today, but you can look up in your DRI how much folic acid you should be taking, and you can check a fact sheet on your government website from the Food and Nutrition Board about folic acid as well. Okay. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is essential fatty acids. Essential fatty acids. I want to talk about it just because I also feel like it's kind of popular and it's out there, and I thought it would be very current. Yes. Right, so she's saying that her doctor tells her not to eat liver, and yet it has so much value. Agreed. If liver were the only thing between you and death, I would say eat the liver. But uh, fortunately for us, there are other sources of most of the nutrients that liver... Liver is a very rich source in a lot of things, but if you have really, really high cholesterol, and there's the risk of increasing your cholesterol and heart disease associated with that, you have to consider that 
in your equation. Everything is a kind of a risk benefit. And it tastes good too, right? Well, for some people. Um, essential fatty acids. Okay, so the common terms I've listed for you here for the essential fatty acids, you've got your omega-6. These are polyunsaturated fatty acids. Your omega-6, the most common one is linoleic acid. I termed it LA. So food sources are salad dressing, vegetable oil, chicken, whole wheat bread nuts. It's pretty pervasive. Most of us get enough omega-6 in our diet. It's not necessarily the popular essential fatty acid that we're pushing. What makes the essential fatty acids essential is that our body does not produce it. If we don't get it from outside, we don't get it at all. And essential fatty acids are important because they help maintain the structure of your cell membrane. So research has shown that if you substitute your saturated fat and your trans fat in your diet with the omega-6 polyunsaturated fats, then you could potentially decrease your risk for heart disease and possibly improve your insulin resistance, which is affiliated with diabetes, okay? Omega-3 fatty acids, which are probably the more common and the one you've heard about more, actually the most common forms, there are three. I'm only gonna say them once because they're really hard to say. First is icosapentaenoic acid, or EPA. The next is docosahexaenoic acid, or DHA. And the last is alpha-linolenic acid, or ALA. Okay, EPA and DHA come from fatty fish, and alpha-linolenic acid, ALA, comes from canola oil, flaxseed, soybean oil. Most of the research about omega-3 finds that if you take enough of omega-3, you, you can reduce your risk for arrhythmias, which is irregular heartbeats, you can decrease your triglyceride levels, you can help lower your blood pressure, and you can also slow down the accumulation of plaque in your arteries. So it sounds pretty good. Most of the research for omega-3 fats is associated with the EPA and the DHA. Okay, so a lot of products that uh, have soybean oil or canola oil are going to say, look at me, look at me, I have an omega-3, I'm ALA. Yes, there is some correlation between ALA and those benefits that I just listed for you, but it's not as strong as the research that is for the EPA and the DHA. So certainly you want to get your ALA but you want to focus more on the EPA and the DHA when you're thinking about these particular areas. ALA can be converted to EPA and DHA in your body, but the conversion is very tightly regulated. So you may not necessarily get, if I take X amount of ALA, I'm going to produce X amount of, it doesn't necessarily correlate amount to amount. There was a period of time, I don't know if you've heard, where the focus was make sure you get the right ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 you know, uh, the people in America sometimes get like 17 to 1 in terms of a ratio of omega-6 to omega-3. Most of us are eating salad dressing, vegetable oil, chicken, whole wheat bread, nuts, and we're not necessarily eating the fatty fish. And so that ratio was very much off kilter. There was a lot of research out there where they said, oh my God, you take it, it's going to be toxic, it's really bad for you. Right now, the American Heart Association says, don't focus so much on the ratio. Just focus on eating healthy and doing the right thing. You want to have enough omega-6, you want to use your omega-6 to replace your saturated fat and your trans fat, and you also want to have enough omega-3. Don't focus too much on, do I have enough of this compared to that? So here I've listed for you the recommendations for omega-6 and omega-3. This is an AI, an adequate intake. They don't have enough research right now for an RDA. Okay, and you can see um, it differs between men and women. Okay, so, I don't, have, I don't have on this paper a, food, a specific food source for omega-6. That's really because typically we are not deficient in the amount of omega-6 we get in our diet. I did write down some of my notes. Like, for example, one tablespoon of safflower oil is 10 grams of linoleic acid. Corn oil, a tablespoon, is 7.3 grams. That's one tablespoon. So if you can imagine how much of these things you get in your snack foods or in your oil in the foods that you're eating, it's typically enough. The issue is more with the omega-3. Most people don't have enough fish in their diet. So the American Heart Association actually put out recommendations for how you should think about omega-3s and whether or not you should be considering a supplement. So the first group, that's on the top of your last page. Um, the first is the group who have no documented heart disease at all. The American Heart Association does not recommend you take an omega-3 supplement, a fish oil supplement. They recommend that you try to focus on getting enough of the fatty fish at least twice a week. Okay, and of course, to eat foods with ALA. 
they don't recommend a uh, fish oil supplement. If you do have coronary heart disease, if you do have some documented heart disease, then maybe you want to try to focus more specifically on getting a gram of EPA and DHA from fatty fish. And if not, you might want to talk to your doctor about whether or not he wants to give you a supplement, a fish oil supplement. Uh, again, fish oil supplements should not be taken without conferring with your doctor, especially because fish oil supplements are known to increase bleeding. If you're already on Coumadin, Plavix, Arelto, whatever, aspirin, you're already at increased risk for bleeding. If you, in, if you add to that the omega-3 fish oil supplement, you could have be at even greater risk for bleeding. So definitely discuss that with your doctor. And then those who need to lower your triglyceride levels, you might want to take two to four grams of an EPA DHA capsule again with the supervision of your doctor. Okay, so then I feel uncomfortable if I don't bring up the issue of mercury when we're talking about eating fatty fish, because that is a problem when we're eating fatty fish, the risk for mercury. Okay, so at the bottom, I give you sources of omega-3 in fish and the amount of mercury in a serving. So basically the FDA says it is safe for you to eat up to seven ounces of high mercury fish a week. So high mercury means one part per million. As you can see, nothing on my list here is one part per million. The four famous um, high mercury fish are your swordfish, which is obviously not something we're eating, or shark, your tilefish, which is like your snapper, and then um, your king mackerel. Those are considered your high mercury fish. Shouldn't be eating that more than once a week maximum. Of course, if you're pregnant, which I don't know if anyone is, but if you're pregnant, these uh, recommendations are stricter. Okay, so seven ounces is, stri is only if you're not pregnant. Um, I had to say it just in case. Um, the medium mercury fish, you can eat up to 14 ounces a week, so that's going to be 0.5 part per million. That might be like your red snapper, might be in that category. Um, you can kind of get a list. I believe the American Heart Association has a more uh, bigger list in your, they have this uh, website with uh, a, a handout called Fish 101, and it gives you a more complete listing. Um, and then, of course, if you have the lower mercury fishes, which is 0.2 parts per million, you can, they usually don't set a limitation on that, and that is because typically it's safe to eat up to two pounds a week, which I'm assuming most of us don't do. So I gave you a list of decent sources of omega-3 that are in that last category. Okay, so look at sardines. And if you eat the sardines with bones, you get calcium too. Okay, so that's kind of, I just want to also mention if you're curious about how many vitamins or minerals or nutrients are in any of the foods that you eat, let's say it doesn't have a label, you're having trouble, you can go to the USDA, the United States uh, Department of Agriculture website. They have something called a nutrient database. You can put in any food, like for example, if you put in um, apple, like a hundred different variations will come up, apple cobbler, baby food apple. Apple raw, apple cooked, apple with skin, apple without skin. You pick the one that you want to know about. It'll give you a serving size in that food group, and it'll tell you how many calories, how much fat, how much protein, vitamin C, vitamin D, B12 is in that food. So that might be a reference if you're really trying to get a handle on what food you're eating. OK, is there any questions on essential or anything? Yes. You don't have olive oil on anything. Olive oil is a monounsaturated fat. It's not a polyunsaturated fat. Is that good or bad? It's not bad. Monounsaturated fat's great, but it's not going to have the polyunsaturated fatty acids. You Correct. You can, monounsaturated fatty acid as a replacement of saturated fat is amazing. That's the basis for the Mediterranean diet. Okay? But it is not going to contain your essential fatty acids, which are polyunsaturated. That doesn't mean one is better than the other, just different. Mm -hmm. In terms of the omega-3, I don't know. I don't, I don't know, actually. I'm not sure if there's a difference between how much omega-3 would be in the oil or the water. I would think not, because it's actually in the flesh of the fish itself, not necessarily in how it's packaged. I mean, just generally healthy I mean, I would, I mean, you know, it's a function of what you're looking for. If you are extremely underweight and you're looking to put calories in, take it with the oil. There's extra calories. If you are not extremely underweight and you're looking to limit your calories, why would you have the extra oil? Of course, with tuna, the other thing you have to be concerned about is sodium. 
I generally recommend if you're going to eat tuna from a can, you should rinse it off to try to get rid of some of the extra sodium that's in there. Yes? I wanted to find out, uh, there's been a lot of uh, discussion lately about cancer prevention, and do any of these vitamins that you come across or anything uh, supposedly do some prevention? Right, I mean, so cancer prevention, there are. I mean, they talk about the, the cancer prevention vi vitamins they talk about are the antioxidants. Vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin E. The problem is there just isn't enough research for me to come here and tell you definitively, oh, yes, if you take this vitamin supplement, your chances for cancer are cut in half. I mean, there just isn't enough data. And to be honest, I will give you one example. Um, in the 90s, they did a study on beta carotene. They found in observational studies that people who had a lot of beta carotene, which is uh, vitamin A, okay, in their diet from fruits and vegetables had a, a decreased incidence of lung cancer. They said, great, let's give people who smoke some beta carotene supplements and see if it helps reduce their incidence of, of cancer. What happened? They had to stop the study in the middle because they actually found the people with beta carotene had increased lung cancer compared to those who didn't. Crazy, right? Who knows? Maybe the observational study, it wasn't just the beta carotene they were eating. Maybe it was the beta carotene in conjunction with the other components of the food. Maybe it was part of their healthy lifestyle. People who tend to eat fruits and vegetables tend to exercise, tend to be at a better weight. So the problem is that it's very difficult to isolate out one specific vitamin or mineral, isolate it out make it into one product, and then say, here's the answer to all your problems. Because unfortunately, things work in conjunction with others. I think we might be just about out of time. So thank you very much.